everyone. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C. Uh, and today I'm joined by members of my administration to provide updates on the district's response to COVID-19. Our recovery efforts uh, will also make some announcements regarding uh, the new hospital uh, east of the river. Um, but before I do that, I want to make some um, personnel announcements. Uh, first, I am very uh, happy uh, to announce that I have appointed uh, Kevin Donahue to serve as the next city administrator for the District of Columbia. Uh, Kevin, yes. Yes, I think that deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, Kevin is known uh, to all of you. He has had a long, distinguished career in district government uh, and in the federal government. I appointed Kevin as the deputy city administrator and the deputy mayor for public safety in January of 2015. And he has served as the interim city administrator since August 2020. During my first term, Kevin oversaw the district's public safety agencies as well as our operations in internal uh, support agencies. And prior to joining the district government, again, uh, Mr. Donahue served as the director of the federal government's Performance Improvement Council. In that role, he led the implementation of federal policies on using data and performance management to improve government services. And previously, Mr. Donahue worked at the General Service Administration, serving as the senior advisor to the administrator and at the United States Department of Treasury, serving as senior advisor uh, to the assistant Assistant Secretary for Management and Chief Financial Officer. Uh, and previously, Mr. Donahue served in district government uh, under Mayor Adrian Fenty as the director of the CAPSTAT program. Uh, and with that long set of credentials, I think I can safely say that Kevin is at home in DC government uh, and he is going to be an outstanding city administrator for the district. Welcome Kevin again in this role. I also uh, want to thank uh, Dr. Roger Mitchell for everything he has done for both uh, district government, uh, both as the chief medical examiner, as well as the interim deputy mayor for public safety and justice. Roger cares uh, deeply uh, for our city, uh, for the work that he does, and he is passionate about improving the lives of DC residents. Uh, Roger Roger has accepted a role outside of D.C. government that will allow him to continue uh, his important work. Uh, so we want to thank Roger not only for transforming the office of the chief medical examiner, uh, but also serving in a role uh, that I asked him uh, to do uh, late uh, in the summer uh, as deputy mayor for public safety and justice, which he has attacked uh, with equal rigor. So please give Dr. Roger Mitchell a round of applause. Uh, so uh, I am also uh, announcing the appointment of Chris Geldhart uh, to be uh, the acting deputy mayor for public safety and justice. Uh, Chris Geldhart is also known to you. He's currently serving as the director of the Department of Public Works and you may remember uh, that Chris Geldhart has also served in district government as the director of the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management from 2012 to 2017. I also tapped him uh, to uh, serve in an interim capacity as the director of the Office of Unified Communications during our tenure. Currently, uh, Chris is also assisting with our COVID relief uh, efforts uh, in leading our operations branch. We are looking forward uh, uh, to Chris's uh, go at it style uh, and his expertise in leading people as he has done at DPW, as he has done at Homeland Security, the Office of Unified Communications, uh, and now in his role in working with cabinet colleagues uh, to lead our cluster for public safety and justice. Welcome again, Chris Geltart. 
I am also proud to introduce and announce that Christine Davis will step up and serve as the interim director of DPW. Christine currently serves as the agency's general counsel. It's a role that she has been in since 2001, and she knows the agency uh, extremely well, and I want to thank her for stepping up in that leadership role. So welcome, Christine, to your new role. I also want uh, to announce the appointment, and that we are all very proud of Dr. Francisco Diaz as the acting uh, chief medical examiner for the District of Columbia, Dr. Diaz. Uh, Dr. Diaz has been uh, at OCME since 2017. Uh, he was recruited by Dr. Mitchell uh, to serve as his deputy. Uh, Dr. Diaz received his medical degree in um, the Dominican Republic, and after receiving his medical degree, he trained uh, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania at Temple University. And during his career, Dr. Diaz has performed more than 8,000 autopsies and testified for an uh, hundreds of times in circuit, district, and federal courts. He has also provided numerous civil depositions. Dr. Diaz is the author of 35 peer-reviewed articles, abstracts, and presentations, and has been invited on numerous occasions to speak at regional, national, and international conferences. Dr. Diaz is, a board, is board certified in anatomic pathology as well as forensic pathology and is a fellow of the College of American Pathologists and the National Association of Medical Examiners where he serves on the membership, death and custody and government affairs committees. Welcome Dr. Diaz <laughs> to your new position I should say. I also uh, want to introduce to some, as they say, uh, Linda Harley Harper, though she is well known to many in our city. Uh, Linda is a visionary leader in social and criminal justice, and she currently serves as the senior deputy director at the DC Department of Youth and Rehabilitation Services. Uh, and today I am pleased to appoint Linda as the new director of gun violence prevention in the District of Columbia. Please give Linda a big round of applause. In this role, Linda will be responsible for heading strategic development review and implementation of our gun violence prevention uh, efforts. Linda certainly has a heart for our communities and those impacted by violence as evidenced by her long career helping young people. Uh, I would like to say that Linda uh, started her career with DC Public Schools uh, as a substance abuse prevention and intervention coordinator at the former Oak Hill Youth Center. And for more than 15 years, Ms. Harley Harper has successfully led and supported reform efforts in the district's juvenile justice system and is credited with launching a network of contracted local community-based providers designed to serve as an alternative to residential care or detention. So thank you, uh, Linda, for stepping up to new, this new challenge as well. I would also like to announce that we will be sending uh, to the council and uh, uh, that I'm appointing to serve as the next commissioner for the Public Service Commission, Emil Thompson. Uh, Emil Thompson uh, did not, uh, was not able to join us this morning, um, but he's also known to uh, the district government. He formerly served in uh, the deputy mayor's office for public safety and justice. And he is now serving as a member of the DC Water Board. Uh, he has, uh, he uh, and the other commissioners of DC Water uh, certainly have brought a passion to how we regulate utilities in the district. And I know he will bring that same passion uh, to the Public Service Commission. Uh, and finally, uh, I would, um, it's, it is a final announcement uh, and one that uh, I'm, I'm mixed about because uh, we're saying goodbye to a good friend uh, with the department, with the departure of Lamont Akins, who I think is here as well. There he is, right? Don't 
don't do it. Uh, and Lamont uh, is actually probably outside of my family, one of the first people to support me uh, in public life. So I want to thank Lamont for his tenure working with us um, in the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs as the director, and certainly wish him the best in his pursuits outside of DC government. So please hear it uh, for the team. So with that, I want to just turn uh, quickly uh, to Kevin, Dr. Mitchell, and Lamont if they would like to say a few words. I have to admit I wasn't expecting that last part of how we ended there. Um, uh, so um, uh, I would serve uh, the mayor in any capacity. She's both a great leader for D.C. and just quite frankly like a really great boss to have. Uh, and it's been an honor. Um, I actually started at the D.C. Department of Transportation uh, as an entry to mid-level analyst. And um, to be here being announced as a city administrator 20 years later is something I never would have imagined. Uh, so thank you. And I will work very hard every day for the residents of D.C. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the mayor for opportunity to serve this city the way uh, I have over the last seven years. Um, when we found the office of the chief medical examiner, uh, we needed to do some work. Um, and since then, we are accredited both nationally and internationally and built a strong team. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Diaz is a, a fine forensic pathologist and physician. Um, he is one of the authors of the recent uh, book, Spitz and Fisher, um, which is functionally the Bible of forensic medicine. So the district is in good hands. As it relates to uh, gun violence prevention and the public health approach to violence prevention that the city is embarking upon, uh, we are on the right trajectory. And the work that the mayor is doing along with the team uh, is phenomenal. Um, and we will have success. Um, and I just want to thank my, my staff. I want to thank uh, my colleagues uh, for trusting in me for these seven years and helping me lead this organization and the opportunities that had been put in front of me um, by my leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, I have some more to report, and then you can ask questions. How's that? Okay, I'll try to go quickly. So should we go to the COVID update? Okay, so um, I'm displaying now the recent data that we report each morning, and it goes without saying, but I'll, but I'll say it anyway, we are all very excited to be focused on the vaccine, um, but we know that we have to continue uh, to do all that we can to mitigate spread. So continue to wear your mask, keep your distance, limit your exposure to other people, and by all means, stay home if you feel sick. Uh, and I think everyone heard President Biden's announcement uh, in the last days. Uh, yesterday, the Biden administration committed to increasing the district's vaccine allocation by 15 cents. 15% for the next three weeks. Uh, and while that is welcome news, uh, we know too uh, that we will continue to have less vaccine um, than we need to meet the demand for DC residents. But this, uh, not only the increase, but the, um, the knowledge of knowing at three weeks at a time what we're gonna get is welcome news. And just uh, a refresher, I want to make sure everyone knows uh, all of those who are eligible to get vaccinated in D.C. now and continue to follow vaccinate.dc.gov for the latest information. But um, that list includes individuals in healthcare settings, uh, including our fire and EMS workers, residents of long-term and intermediate care facilities, D.C. residents who are 65 years or older, DC residents experiencing homelessness, uh, members of MPD, uh, teachers uh, who are working in person at DC public schools, or DC public charter schools, uh, and Department of Corrections employees. Um, this week, we started vaccinating our public school teachers and I wanted to just show the latest numbers, uh, DCPS vaccination appointments that have been filled or 2,700 out of 
the available 3,800, approximately 3,800 uh, DC teachers and staff who have received those so far this week are 460. Uh, we are also, um, we've also filled just over 1,000 appointments for public charter school teachers and about 280 of them have already received um, their vaccines. Yesterday, we also announced uh, some changes that we made to vaccinate.dc.gov's portal based on feedback that we received to make the portal uh, easier to use. Uh, and I've listed uh, several changes um, that have been made and I hope um, that people have already realized those improvements. DC Health has also uh, quadrupled the number of call takers who will be available on the mornings when appointments become available. Uh, so now up to 200 people are helping residents book appointments who call the call line. We have also uh, made a testing update. Uh, we announced that DC Health and Downtown and Golden Triangle Bids are partnering to offer additional free COVID testing. Uh, and that free COVID testing will be available for essential workers through this new uh, testing, uh, pop-up testing site at I Street near the intersection of Black Lives Matter Plaza. Uh, that will, those who are eligible are include hotel staff, restaurant workers, building engineers, environmental service staff, janitorial staff, security staff, and uh, any um, other individual unable to perform their work at home. The hours will be Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. This site is in addition to our other free public testing sites. I uh, also wanted to just mention quickly uh, a, what, a bill we introduced this week uh, that we shared with all of you, uh, the Reopen Washington, D.C. Alcohol Act. Uh, and this is an example of some of the thinking and action we're now taking to help businesses come back in the district. Um, this legislation, which you can read the complete text of, uh, will help us rebuild the district's economy. Um, so please uh, check out the information related to reopen Washington, D.C. Alcohol Act, which modernizes our alcohol um, rules and regulations. Further this week with, the, with Events D.C., we also announced the launch of phase two of the D.C. CARES program, which will provide over $8 million in relief funding to excluded workers in D.C. Eligible workers include people who have been omitted from federal stimulus efforts and are experiencing financial hardship due to the COVID um, pandemic. And finally, uh, before we wrap up, uh, we have some very important updates um, on our progress toward building a new hospital at St. Elizabeth's East. And not just a new hospital, but a system of care that meets the needs of all residents, attacks health disparities, and makes us more resilient for challenges that lie ahead. First, we are excited to announce that a new urgent care facility is coming to the Maple View Flats in Ward 8. The new facility will open in late 2021 and provide standard urgent outpatient services. Uh, this is an important step in expanding access to high quality care and the location of a second urgent care facility uh, will be located in Ward 7 and will be announced th this spring. In addition, we are happy uh, to report that Universal Health Services is awarding the architecture and engineering contract for the new full service hospital at St. Elizabeth's East, uh, which will allow the project to continue uh, to move forward. The design uh, and engineering will be completed by two of the largest and most prestigious national and local firms. HOK and McKissick and McKissick. In addition, this team will invest 40% of the project with local C CBEs, ensuring local businesses benefit and play an integral role in building the hospital. 
So now that the design team is in place, UHS and the district will move into the next phase of the project, which includes planning for the new hospital and ambulatory centers design, community engagement, and the selection of a construction management team. And most importantly for DC residents, the project remains on schedule to open in late 2024. Uh, so with that, uh, I will take questions. Yes, sir. To ask Reverend Dr. Mitchell why he's leaving. <clears throat> well, thank you, Sam. Um, I've been uh, I have an opportunity um, to to go and be a professor and chair of pathology at Howard University, um, and so this is an opportunity for me um, to move into the academic side of medicine and to pour into um, the hundreds of medical students that will be coming through. Uh, through those doors. It also allows me to focus a, a bit more on my ministry um, um, that I'll be building here in the city. Yes. Good morning, Mayor Bowser here at Fox, reporter at Fox 5 DC. There's an equity issue with the vaccine. Um, in Maryland and Virginia, more white people have gotten vaccinated, over 200,000 um, compared to black and Latino people, about 50,000. I realize DC doesn't have that data yet, are you working on it? Do you think those numbers are similar? And as mayor, what are you doing to make sure minorities are getting the vaccine because they are disproportionately hit harder by the coronavirus? Sure, let me invite uh, Dr. Nesbitt to answer your question. Sure, uh, there's a couple of things that we're doing and we're gonna publish and release a process flow uh, that we think will help people uh, better understand how vaccines are allocated in the district. Uh, and um, that process flow will uh, not only give some insight into the appointment process, but also where vaccines are allocated in terms of the sites. Uh, so I'll uh, address first the vaccine allocation process in terms of sites. Uh, on a weekly basis, the District of Columbia allocates vaccines to the appointments that are available in our portal. Uh, so the vaccinate.dc.gov system or if individuals call the uh, call center, the 1-855-363-0333 number. We also allocate vaccines to our health systems and our federally qualified health centers or community health centers. Uh, so every district hospital or integrated health system, uh, so the MedStar system, GW, Howard, Sibley, Providence Health System, Kaiser, and six of our federally qualified health centers or community health centers receive vaccine from us in order to be able to reach their patient population. Uh, we are one of the jurisdictions in the country that has begun very early on. We're in the seventh week of our program, which we expect to be a several months long program. So very early on in our program, we have given vaccine to our federally qualified health centers. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with federally qualified health centers and safety net hospitals that serve a disproportionate share of the Medicaid population, such as Howard University, their goal is to serve racial and ethnic minority populations. So we've been focused on reaching the vulnerable populations of racial and ethnic minorities from the outset in terms of how we allocate and distribute our vaccines. We've been giving those centers and health centers and those safety net hospitals vaccine for several weeks to reach out to their patients. The third bucket for which we allocate doses of vaccine are specialty population clinics or closed pods or mobile sites. So you'll recall that last week we gave you all information in terms of the specific amount of doses of vaccine, just to give some insight into how many doses that came into the district. The number of doses that we were, it, we were allocating to a special clinics that go to on-site senior residential properties that are for low-income residents who are receiving housing from the DC Housing Authority, for individuals who have intellectual and developmental disabilities receiving support from our Department of Disability Services, others who may be receiving support from our Department of Behavioral Health, and those who are in the custody of the District of Columbia and our Department of Corrections. So again, being very focused on ensuring that we allocate vaccine to those populations. So much of the discussion in the District of Columbia has focused on the first bucket and whether or not there is equity in that process. We have an equity approach in that process as well. 
to ensure that residents who have had a disproportionate burden of disease in wards one, four, five, seven, and eight have an advantage in terms of accessing appointments. Their appointments are released a day before the appointments that are released citywide. And we allocate a proportion of those appointments at this point, or initially it was 75% of the total number of appointments we're gonna release in that bucket are released a day ahead. They're available by online portal and call center. And then we release the remaining of the appointments in that bucket or that vaccine allocation the next day. So we are all absolutely focused on equity, equity and access in the vaccine not only through the appointment process, but in terms of how we distribute vaccine to our providers. In terms of the data, um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and yield and give you data with a whole bunch of caveats, uh, because it is critically important in the United States that every state publish their data on race and ethnicity. The challenge that we've had is ensuring that vaccine providers give us the data and they collect it at the time of dose administration. We've had a tremendously challenging time having vaccine providers actually collect race and ethnicity data. So at this point, I know that 28% of the doses have gone to individuals who are white, non-Hispanic, 15% have gone to individuals who are black, non-Hispanic, and the rest of the data has been entered as unknown or other. If I release that data and it's used to compare us to other jurisdictions, it must come with a number of caveats. And that's not the data quality that we wanna have our a reputation for here in the District of Columbia. So we'll release it beginning next week with a bunch of caveats and a commitment to continue to improve the quality of that data. Like the language barrier, or people who don't have internet access can't sign up. Or Absolutely. So let me, let me restate what I just said. In the other two buckets, right, outside of the vaccine portal, those individuals are being contacted by their healthcare providers. Federally qualified centers, if you've never met an operator of a federally qualified health center, are uniquely positioned, their mission, half of their board are patients, okay? So they have expertise in terms of how to reach individuals. They have ex extreme expertise and how to reach individuals who have English as a second language, who have disabilities, who have access and transportation challenges in terms of getting to their city, I mean, to their site. Furthermore, we have worked with community-based organizations like the Latin American Youth Center, the Health Alliance Network, Leadership for Healthy Communities, to be able to help mobilize people in the community to understand why they should accept the vaccine. Even our mailer that we sent to our highest risk zip codes has information how Medicaid beneficiaries can access their transportation benefit to get to a site for vaccine, in addition to telling them how they can register for an appointment. So there's numbers of things that are being done to address the equity issues in the District of Columbia. But I would actually encourage all of you to be ambassadors for the vaccine to be able to address confidence as well make sure that there isn't dis misinformation out there in our communities because it takes more than the health department to increase vaccine confidence in the District of Columbia and the nation. Yeah, yeah a follow on that, uh, Dr. Nexvick. Are you seeing, uh, <laughs> thank you, um, are you seeing any success in prioritizing uh, seniors in certain zip codes on, on Thursday that looks for Monday's data? that war three seniors are still getting vaccinated at a higher rate. And then a second question, I know you said yesterday on the conference call with the council that uh, DC Health is against the concept of a wait list. So can you further explain why? Okay, so um, a wait list assumes that a person is in a position to advance numerically for a dose of the vaccine. It is impossible to apply an equity model that ensures that people who are at the highest risk for the vaccine gets it, regardless of when they become knowledgeable of the process or regardless of when they make a decision to get the vaccine. So from my perspective, if you create a wait list that allows someone to effectively get a number and a ticket and monitor numerically when they get the vaccine, you cannot do that concurrently with applying an equity model. Does that help you with that concept? Yes. Okay. And then the first question was, are you seeing any, what are you seeing on your end as far as, like, are you sure. back on the zip code? Sure. So when we first began applying the current equity model that we have in place, 
uh, which can be adjusted based on feedback or based on when we see uh, differences between, there's a difference again, because we have those three buckets. So there's a difference between what you see with the vaccine registration and appointment scheduling process. So right now we're applying an equity model to that process. And then we have an equity model to the process overall with those three buckets, right? Of how we allocate vaccine. So we have a process of how we allocate appointments and we have a process of how we allocate vaccine. Both should be equitable. So in terms of the data that you're looking at, that's in terms of who's been vaccinated. There's going to be a difference between who is vaccinated and who gets appointments through the district's process because it is possible to be vaccinated without having to go through the district's appointment scheduling process. So speaking specifically to the district's appointment scheduling process, the first week that that process was open to individuals over the age of 65, 70.4% of the appointments went to residents in wards two, three, and six. 29.6% went to residents in wards one, four, five, seven, and eight. Since that equity model was applied, 50.5% of appointments have gone to residents in wards five, seven, and eight. I mean, one, four, five, seven, and eight. And 49.5% of appointments have gone to residents in wards two, three, and six. However, if you look at the data overall, we still have more residents in Ward 3, 2, 3, and 6 who are being vaccinated. Thank you. So, Dr. Yeah. Anderson, can we follow up on that? Why, why is that? I mean, when we look at your data and we, you know, we look at just people over 65 who have received their first dose, we see 3,600 people in Ward 3 who have received their first shot compared to 800 people for, in, in Ward 7. And so I get the buckets and I get your best efforts to be equitable, but what people are seeing and what, you know, the perception from district residents is that people in affluent neighborhoods are far outpacing people in economically depressed neighborhoods for access to the vaccine. This is an excellent follow-up question, Mark. Uh, so we'll, we, you have to remember that this is, this process did not begin when we began vaccinating people and perceptions of the vaccine did not begin when we started vaccinating people. And one of the things that we focus on at the health department is not the same thing necessarily that most of our questions come from, which, the, which is the how people get vaccinated, right? We focus on the why people get vaccinated and why people don't get vaccinated. So that drives at some of the earlier discussions that we uh, facilitated or had. When we polled in the District of Columbia, 96% of white non-Hispanic DC residents were willing to accept the vaccine. Around 93% of DC residents who identified as Asian were willing to accept the vaccine. 86% of those who identified as Hispanic or Latinx were willing to accept the vaccine, compared to 61% of those who identified as black, non-Hispanic or African-American. OK, so you have to be willing to give voice to that data in terms of willingness to accept the vaccine. While we recognize that there is a benefit of people beginning to get vaccinated, telling their stories. We've done that. We put that information out there to move those acceptance rates and help us gain ground. Some of that hesitation was there when we began the process. So you have to recognize how that has an impact. The next thing is who is eligible? in each ward. So some of the cumulative data that you're looking at, you shouldn't focus on it only as 65 and older. If you choose to do that, you have to remember that 65 year olds are not equitably distributed across the District of Columbia. The highest proportion of the District 65 and older residents live in wards three and four. The lowest proportion of district residents age 65 and older live in wards one and eight. So every ward does not have the same proportion of eligible residents for vaccination. If you recall who was eligible before we moved into phase 1B, both tiers one and tiers two, we were vaccinating healthcare workers in phase 1A. The majority of those healthcare workers were not district residents. And even when we think about the district, the healthcare workers who were district residents, they too were not equitably distribute, distributed across all wards. So there's a part of that phenomenon that you also have to think about. Okay, Perry? Yeah, thank you. I have a couple questions that span a few topics. And sorry, Dr. Ned, did one more vaccine. Um, okay, go ahead. 
What, um, I was surprised to see how many extra teacher vaccines there were, and I'm curious um, why you see so many appointments that have not been made among the DCPS staff. Are you seeing you have, you know, an oversupply for them, or there's mistrust in the vaccine in that some of the groups there, or what's happening then, and what will happen if there are leftover vaccines? Will you put them towards another group? Well, well, to your question, I think that in all of our sectors uh, where there is great diversity, remember in our educational in our educational facilities or when we talk about DCPS, we're vaccinating anyone who works in that setting. Uh, so there's a diversity of who we're vaccinating. We're vaccinating not only the teachers, we're vaccinating the, the front desk staff, we're vaccinating environmental services, we're vaccinating the people who work in food services, we're vaccinating anyone in the building. And the security guards, we're vaccinating everyone. So they're a microcosm of our society. They're the microcosm of the people in our region. So the same views and perspectives that I just shared with you about the vaccine would hold true in those environments. And they look like our community overall, right? They reflect who the makeup is of our community overall. So we have to give them vaccine counseling and education, address any concerns that they have around the vaccine, be very forthcoming with them about the benefits over any perceived risk of the vaccine and have those open and honest conversations. Even when I speak to our long-term care facilities, there are healthcare providers and healthcare workers in those facilities who wanted to see what happened with the first dose with their colleagues before they got vaccinated. So that same phenomenon can happen in any sector, okay? So those are the things that we have to be mindful about. But we want a message to everyone, when your time comes, when you're placed in line, when your turn comes up, accept the vaccine. We have millions, tens of millions of people who have been vaccinated in this country. The vaccine is safe and effective, and we need to get doses and arms of people to be able to move forward as a community and as a society. Our message is very clear on this. Can I just pick up another kind of... Um, I would answer your question in an additional way, uh, because I, quite frankly, am very pleased with the DCPS numbers. Um, I'm pleased, first of all, that we've been able to prioritize teachers uh, and so that all of our in-person staff has access uh, to the vaccine. And not every jurisdiction can say that. So I am very pleased that not only have we been able to prioritize it, we've been able to roll out um, a very um, clear way that all of our teachers can participate. Uh, and we know uh, that teachers will talk to each other, they'll learn about the experience, and they may continue to sign up. Yes. Okay, um, welcome back. And, and use Channel 8. I've made the wrong. Okay, all right. So uh, um, we had just a couple questions um, to, to sort of shift gears um, to more of the, the policing, public uh, sure. safety vein. Um, so we heard um, from Chief Conti earlier this week. We got some of the prepared remarks from the House Appropriations Committee, and we wanted to just get a sense of what is um, sort of the state of the police department now as they nurse, you know, some of this trauma from the from the riot it's, it's not just mental but physical can you kind of give us a little insight into what resources sure i'm going to ask dr mitchell to say that and thank you for that question i think there's been a lot of um appropriate attention uh, to the injuries that officers incurred, uh, not just our officers at MPD, but at the Capitol Police, both physical and traumatic uh, injuries that we are very concerned about and Chief Conti is very concerned about. Thank you for the question. And, and I think it's important to have concern about our first responders, particularly the Metropolitan Police Department officers. Um, uh, Chief Conti has made it clear that he is making, placing emphasis on the mental health uh, support of his officers. Uh, there has been one-on-one -on -one, uh, debriefs with the CPUs, as, 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 um, as, as you may know, but also a larger initiative he's pulling together, not only with the uh, physician of MPD, but also with the Department of Behavioral Health um, to make sure that our officers have access um, not just in the wake of what happened on the 6th, but also ongoing. Um, we know that um, law enforcement stress uh, is extremely important to, to remedy and to treat on an ongoing basis. Um, and so we know that that's part of his initiatives as the new chief of police. Um, I have 
one uh, follow up quick question yeah. to that. Um, in light of the DHS bulletin that was issued yesterday, um, this ongoing threat, um, is there any conversation among leaders in the district as well as federal law enforcement partners about reorganizing the way we approach these massive multi-jurisdictional uh, crises? Is there like a, perhaps a new MOUs being generated? And then further, do you think you're going to ask for, is there any talk of a new NSSE designation coming up? Well, the NSSCs always go with a joint um, meeting of con when the, the presidential address to Congress, the State of the Union. Uh, so I expect that will be the next one. Okay. Um, and I have directed Director Rodriguez, who is the Director of District's Homeland Security Agency, uh, to work on what I call a new posture. Um, and we are we will have those discussions with our, our federal partners and a close examination of our local our local needs too. Are you asking for more control? Well, um, I've been asking for more control. Well, I mean, it, it, like, I, I guess I just mean in, in the more immediately. I mean, more control in terms of- Yes, uh, immediately. We've been um, very focused on the, Nash, the DC National Guard. Again, I won't go into my rant about, you know, how they're not actually the district's National Guard. So, but that's uh, that's the first and most um, immediate change that we think is necessary. Yes, Tom. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question for the new Deputy Mayor of Public Safety. Sure, sure, uh, Chris. Mr. Geldart, there are fears in the wake of the Trump riot January 6th that security fencing will remain a lot longer in this city. Can you just give us an update on your understanding of what the fencing is? I think you had a role in this as the DPW director. I know sure. it's mostly federal, but how much more encroachment will there be? And then I also have a question about your new job. Sure, sure, Tom. And to, to get to the answer about the fencing, um, we, in conversations with uh, the federal government, both um, the executive and the legislative side, um, you know, we still have fencing that's uh, around Lafayette Park as well as up on Capitol Hill. And I know that they're looking at that right now and trying to determine what's the adequate posture to take with that, and we're in conversations with that, uh, with them. Uh, and it goes to the questions that were earlier of how do we ensure that uh, we look at what we have potentially coming at us, briefing from DHS yesterday and all, uh, of how we need to be postured. And as the mayor said, uh, we're looking at that very seriously in the city. So we'll continue those conversations. Uh, Councilmember Charles Allen and others and citizens, including me, are, are worried that there's already new talk now about fencing off Congress, the congressional land, just like the White House is, which would severely limit the access by people who live in Port 6 tourists and others. Is, does the city have a position on whether or not the congressional grounds should be fenced off? That's to you, Mayor. Um, and l let me just, before you make the fencing around the White House a permanent structure, it is not. Um, that is a temporary structure. Um, and I, I would view the fencing around, certainly the current fencing around the Capitol to be temporary as well. Um, so I think that there is um, some, some view from all of us that there are still some very volatile events happening. Um, which require extra security, um, the impeachment process going up through the national, uh, the next national special security event that we all have to be mindful of. So I would look at that uh, as a time period where we're definitely going to have uh, extra security. If you're asking uh, our view, we want the city to be safe. We want all of the institutions to be safe but we don't want uh, extra troops or fences to be a long-term fixture. Okay, a few more. Yes. I actually have one more for you, but while you mentioned that, we have the Super Bowl weekend coming up. Are you planning any new uh, emergency measures to deal with crowds that could gather for the Super Bowl? Uh, our current guidelines would deal with anything like that. Okay. May I finish? Yes. What's your question? It's for the... Okay, let me hear it. <laughs> well, Deputy, new Deputy Mayor, the Mayor will interpret my question for you. Perhaps. Your title is Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice. Will you address the second part of your title, Justice, and your views of racial, of improving racial justice in our city? Sure. Thanks for that question, Tom. And it's a, it's a good question, a very important question. Um, I think Dr. Mitchell and the team have done a good job, a uh, great job in starting to set up and um, with Director Polly Harper coming in to, to some of that role. Um, and some of the things that uh, our new chief of police. Um, so I think we've got a good team 
around this now, and I think we need to take a look at those things that uh, have started to be put in place uh, around that and where we need to go for that so that we're truly getting to the heart of how do we ensure that we still do the job we need to do for safety as well as addressing those things that we need to ensure that we're looking at the all that has happened over the last year and ensuring that we have justice within that as well. So there's a lot of pieces and parts of that, Tom, and, and I'm very excited of the work that the team has started to do. Um, and I'm excited to work with the council and the team to continue that effort. Do you have any thoughts on that, Mayor, with the, the team you put in place from Mr. Donahue and well, I think Chris uh, said it exactly right. Uh, we've always, uh, in, in our administration, viewed public safety not just as enforcement, enforcement on one side and opportunity on the other. Uh, and in the course of the last six years, we've also added the violence prevention um, efforts. Um, they're kind of disparate around the city right now, quite frankly. And one goal that uh, task that I've given uh, Chris and Linda are to make sure we are maximizing those millions of dollars in human resources to save lives. None of us can be satisfied with the loss of life in our city to gun violence. Uh, we take that uh, very seriously. Uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, has, and his team have developed some strategies that we will talk to you a little bit more about next week. Um, and that are really focused on driving down gun crime and homicide and shootings in our city. Okay, I'll take a couple more. Mark, Amanda, and Perry. Uh, I have a statehood question and a COVID question. Okay. On statehood, um, there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of conversation with Senator Carper reintroducing in a Democratic House, Senate, and White House. Can you lay out your strategy? What is the plan to, one, get around a Republican filibuster? Uh, you know, what is the likelihood that this will actually become a reality? And what is the plan that you have? And then are you open at this time to an incremental approach? I would harken back to the Davis bill when Adrian Fenty was mayor, when there was an opportunity to just get a vote in the House of Representatives, which is much easier than, as you know, the statehood. So what is the plan for statehood? And are you open at this time, given this, this limited window of a Democratic House Senate president going in an incremental step? No, Mark, statehood is really the only way that um, we can uh, fulfill full American citizenship. Uh, having one vote out of 435 is certainly would be um, better than no votes. But having two senators um, is the only way that we can ensure uh, full representation in, in the American system. Uh, and I would point you to a, a tweet I saw. Actually, I saw it this morning, but it was made yesterday um, that I think is the kind of the linchpin on how we move forward. And it was from the Democratic majority leader in the Senate. Um, and he said very straightforwardly that the time for DC, and uh, I'm paraphrasing, but the time for DC statehood is now. And um, it, is, it is his strategy um, that is important to advance uh, statehood uh, in the Senate. Uh, you've heard also in the last week uh, that President Biden affirmed his support uh, for, for D.C. statehood. And you know that we've already had a successful House vote. Um, the Congresswoman who reintroduced the bill this year has more, I think, more co-sponsors than she did uh, last year. So that is, we, we have done all of the work uh, that uh, we needed to do to make all of those leaders be ready to move. Um, and we will continue uh, to work with them in whatever way possible. Yeah, thank you. And then <clears throat> COVID quickly, I'm just wondering with the 15% increase in allocation that's coming, uh, I guess next week, uh, what are your plans to expand? When will private school teachers, I know you've notified them to start getting their ducks in a row, but when will private school teachers, when will child care workers, grocery store workers, the people who are in the current phase but aren't yet eligible, when will they become eligible? Who will get that extra 15% that's coming in? Um, I think that it's being allocated according to the strategy that DC Health has already had in place. I think that the, we're collecting the information on child care workers and the teachers, and I think they're gonna be the next group of um, essential workers. Do you know when? Soon. I don't know exactly when. All of the all of the announcements we make regarding um, 
regarding when groups come in are, are just targets, Mark, as we, we talked about early on. It depends on availability and how, uh, how DC Health is working to provide um, how they will be vaccinated. Yes, Amanda. All right, two COVID questions. Uh, so it appears the district is seeing a sharp deep, uh, decline in cases, um, as is the rest of the country. And so I, I'd like to get... Uh, Can you say that again? Yeah, a sharp decline in cases. Yes. Yeah, we're seeing that. And so I wanted to know what the explanation, what you think the explanation for this is. I mean, are we seeing it amongst a certain age group? Um, I think like this morning, the New York Times newsletter was talking about, you know, some part of the country experiencing herd immunity. So I just, I wanted to get your- Well, I'll give you my two cents. Yeah. Uh, we, we saw uh, our cases go up around the holiday travels from Thanksgiving through Christmas, through inauguration. And now we're seeing that, that all that activity around those holidays as was expected to starting, starting to decline. But I'll let the doctor give you a more full <laughs> explanation. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the mayor's explanation is exactly what we posited um, uh, from an epidemiologic perspective. Uh, it, it is premature to suggest that um, we have reached any level of uh, herd immunity by natural infection or herd immunity by inoculation or vaccination uh, that would be driving down uh, these rates. And, and I think that we also need to be mindful uh, that until we understand more about what these variants uh, that have been demonstrated to have increased rates of transmission can do uh, that have been detected, the British or UK variant being detected in 28 states, um, we, it, although we're experiencing downward trends, unless we get to a level of uh, daily case rate where we have demonstrated containment, uh, which in the district would be 10 cases per day or lower, uh, we would be at risk for an, an acceleration again. So uh, we are uh, um, inspired by a daily case rate that continues to go down, but we need to remain vigilant. So people can need to continue to wear their masks, continue to social distance, continue to avoid large gatherings until we get those daily case rates even lower. Uh, and again, we need to be aggressive with our vaccination efforts. Uh, to be able to uh, induce what is you have referred to uh, as herd immunity through vaccination. That would be our, uh, our, our, our biggest opportunity for success. And then a quick follow on that with the variant. Some experts are saying we should be wearing two masks. What's DC? I don't know. Sure. So, um, you know, all of our guidance documents said we'll be back if we have new data or, or the science suggests that we uh, should. Um, we've been very clear on the type of masks that we know don't work. So we've uh, in our current guidance documents, we've suggested that people should not wear masks with exhalation valves. We see those around town and they make us cringe. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me us to remind people to not wear those. Um, when you wear a cloth mask or a cloth face covering, uh, we recommend that it does have more than one layer or be a thicker material because that has better, oper and it be proper fitting so it doesn't have gaps around your face because that creates an opportunity uh, for uh, particles to get around the mask. If it has double layers or is thicker, uh, then it has the uh, opportunity for fewer particles to come through. Uh, so what uh, people, when they are talking about double layering or wearing more than one mask, sometimes it's a concept of wearing two, one or two cloth face coverings. Some people are just wearing a fashion mask and they wanna make sure that you're not just doing that. Uh, we see a lot of sequins masks uh, that don't have another layer underneath. Uh, so giving people advice around that. The other thing that they're referring to is the potential to have one of the, the uh, if you're wearing a single layer face, a cloth face covering to put a surgical mask uh, underneath or one of the disposable masks underneath uh, to make sure that you have added protection. But it's, it's always been very clear, our current uh, um, gui uh, guidance document, uh, it communicates to you that a cloth face covering allows more particles to come through than a surgical or medical mask and an N95 respirator allows the fewest number of particles to uh, come through. Uh, we have not uh, made an update to our mask. We'll continue, mask guidance will continue to uh, review the science to indicate what we believe it is necessary to recommend to any every district resident that when you leave your home, you should be wearing two masks, or if you have people inside your home who are not part of your household, you should do so. But as for the time being, you should be following the mask guidance as written and wearing your mask correctly and properly and throwing away those masks with exhalation valves. Okay, all right, last question. Yes. 
um, schools are supposed to be reopening on Monday. I'm curious if one, you have any updated numbers of how many people have accepted slots? I think the number is eight. 8,000 okay. that I'm giving you a round number. It could be plus or minus some, but we're about 8,000. Do you know what percentage fit into high priority groups? I don't. No. And so we know that teachers, not all teachers, the union, they're not happy with the, the way buildings are reopening. Um, what recourse do you have if some teachers do not show up on Monday? Do you expect that this could happen? And if it does, what will you do about it? And do you have any kind of backup plan so that kids can get in buildings? Why wouldn't teachers show up? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> so if teachers have been assigned um, and and they haven't submitted a leave request and they don't have a leave re a leave a approved leave, um, they are to to show up to work. We know in Chicago, for instance, staff could take it off the school. We know some did not show up. And are you talking about a planned collective action? Yeah, I'm not saying, well, if anything, teachers, I have no idea. I'm not saying I know what's happening, but I'm, I assume that part of the DC, you guys are thinking about what would happen if um, some teachers decide they don't show up to the building and you have kids go to the building. Yes, and that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have Chancellor Farabee talk to you in some detail about that. Okay, thank you, everybody.